Greetings, everybody. Greetings, greetings, greetings. I know it has been about three, four weeks since we've last come on, uh, but we are back tonight. Last time we were on, we talked about denominations. We talked about baptism. We talked about uh, those sorts of things. And so um, tonight we jump in right. We are jumping right into this conversation. I got my co-host with me, Minister DeAndre Pitts. And uh, I'm going to pass it over to him, let him talk about and kind of introduce our subject for tonight. Good evening, sir. Good evening. How you doing? Good, good, good. Good. Like you said, it's been a while. It's been a long while. But, you know, life goes on. And, you know, uh, life has been good for me. I'm hoping that life has been good for you. Yes, um, sir. But, you know, I thought today that may be a good topic for us to discuss is generations. Um, and... Like with generation can come can come great blessings, mm -hmm. or it can go the opposite way, right? Uh, right. It can be a great curse. You know, we've all experienced and heard about generational curses, generational blessings, and um, you know, it made me think about that today. And um, I think that that may be a good topic for us to talk about because I think as men, it's important for us to consider our actions and consider our decision making because whatever decision we make it influences everybody and impacts everybody who comes underneath us and who's around us. And um, I think if we think that way, I think we may be more conscious and, you know, considerate of the decisions that we make and, and may even lead to more discipline or desire to be more disciplined, I would say. Right. That's interesting. Um, I just, as you were talking again, and I'm one of those people that I do well with study, but I think I do better with like, on the on the fly kind of thing but when you were talking um i thought about i mean just the name of what we're doing sea bears and how men are the sea bearers in our families mm -hmm. um the word generations comes from the word genes and how we pass down our genes and our seed from you know generation to generation to generation mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting you know you have two girls and I have two boys. Yep. And, you know, genetically, it is the father that determines, you know, yep. the sex or the gender of, of the child. Yeah. And with boys, you know, I'm going to be honest. I've said this. I, I wanted girls, I, at least yeah. one girl. I wanted a girl so badly. Yeah. But um, but that wasn't what God had planned for me. And right. so I had to kind of pivot my mind. and was like, oh, well, I have two boys that can carry on the name and, you know, pass on generation to generation. So I think it's a really good topic. And, uh, it's, uh, let's, let's, let's dive in. Absolutely. So let's, 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 let's turn to you for a second. As so I know, like we're talking from a spiritual sense, like you come from a line, um, historically from, from, from preachers and ministers, uh, of the gospel. Um, like, can you talk about that, that impact and how you even identify your identity, how it was so clear to you? Did that have anything to do with your grandfather and the, the people around you? Woo. Well, it's, oh, wow. That, that's a super loaded question. Um, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. It's a curse and a blessing. Um, I'll, I'll start off with I'll end with a good part. The curse is, so to speak, that you are born on a pedestal with expectations, living in a fishbowl where mm -hmm. everybody gets to see your life and has an opinion about your life and what you should do or not do or who you are based upon, you know, the generations that went before you. Yeah. And so that can become very, very difficult um, because, again, I, I'm the third. So that can become very difficult because those who went before you, however great they were, you might have a different personality mm -hmm. and a different call from who they were. Yeah. And sometimes people hold you to that standard of, well, your grandfather or your great grandfather is so and so, and automatically you have to be like this or you have to be like that. Um, and so that can be hard, really kind of finding yourself and finding your voice. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I was talking to someone not too long ago, actually. I was talking to another pastor on Tuesday of this week, uh, last week, and um, uh, you know, I, I was saying growing up, it was like chasing a ghost because my grandfather passed away when I was eight years old. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it wasn't like I was, you know, reared up by him and, you know, and he died the last few years of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, he passed away when I was eight years old. Yeah. So, so oh. to be constantly compared to him, um, him, you know, has been a challenge, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the curse side, so to speak. And I air quote curse It's not a curse, but you know what I mean? Um, and then the blessing side is that just like with anything, um, uh, that has a bad side is normally a good side. So the good side is certain doors and opportunities are automatically open to me yeah. just because <laughs> of who my grandfather was. And mm-hmm. so um, there's also good expectations, right? So for me, I happen to also be in ministry. Um, so it's a little bit easier. And so people kind of give me the benefit of the doubt on certain things. Um, but it's, it, it's important in either case, in either way to find your own voice and find your own identity. And quite frankly, that's why I talk so much about identity because that was something that I really, really struggled with because yeah. of that. Yeah. Because it's like, you don't start from scratch, but you start from scratch. Exactly. Right? Because to your point, you're the third, so you carry the name. So there's already... Of, like people already recognize it and it's like oh this is my expectation because you carry it. so it's almost similar to you think about sports like lebron james exactly he talked about you know sometimes he regret naming his son after him because it brought so much pressure and um and though his son is somewhat living up to it you know he's not buckling under that he's still his own you know his own man and he's making his own decision and he's doing really well for himself it still doesn't negate the fact that hey you're named after one of the greatest basketball players that ever played the game. Yep. You know, when you consider even Michael Jordan and his kids, his kids weren't even named after him, I don't believe. I think his, they carried his middle name. I think one of them did. But, yeah, Marcus and Jeffrey. Yeah, So they, but they were expecting them to be him. And it's right. like, you no, know, because I think that the, I think the thing that we, we negate when we talk about that and we make those, put those demands on people's lives is like, like, yes, we carry the name, Yes, we share some of the same genetics, but the woman who carried us was totally different. Exactly. She has exactly. same too. <laughs> so it's like we're not made up of the exact same thing. Exactly. And I mean, just even the examples that you use with uh, Bronny and, you know, uh, Jeffrey and Marcus, neither of Bronny's not as tall or as big as his dad. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey and Marcus are not as tall as their father either, you know, just from just a physical standpoint. Right. And, and to your point, you know, it's like we automatically make these assumptions. Oh, you're going to be just like your grandfather or your great grandfather or your dad because you have his name and you look just like him. Mm-hmm. Didn't work for that. Didn't ask for that. Yeah. <laughs> you exactly. know what I'm saying? Exactly. I think that's a tough part. Now, granted, I don't, I wasn't named after my dad. Um, now I carry the last name. Sure. So I will tell you. Um, so um, so me and my brother, my dad has seven kids. But me and my brother are the only two to carry the last name in our line. The only two. Now, now picture that. Now look at it from a generational standpoint. Mm-hmm. So my grandmother's kids. So her grandkids, I think there may be one other, but he may be like decades younger than us. But even through that entire generation, me and Devon are the only two to carry the Pitt's last name. There is no one from the oldest grandson, and then Devon would have been the youngest. There is nobody else. Wow. Nobody else to carry it. And and even with that, me and him was talking about that one day because um, actually we was at – Micaiah, their youngest daughter's um, dedication service. And like the more they kept saying the last name, 
the more emotional I got because I'm like, nobody really understands the, the weight that comes with that because if it weren't for these four little girls and like me and Devon decided not to, you know, have kids, that was it. Yeah. That name was dead. So these little girls are so special to me because they get to carry a name into a generation that no other cousin could ever imagine because we're the only two that carry it. Wow. And so like, and then considering our past and our history, like, you know, my dad has certain struggles that he never really overcame, you know, um, you know, he wasn't always there completely. You know, he struggled, he had his reasons, you know, he struggled with drug addiction and things of that nature. And I understand his story. And he thought he was doing us a service by not being around and letting us be exposed to that, though we still needed his presence. Yeah. Right. But with, you know, in his absence in certain cases, there are some things that we wasn't influenced by. Right. You know, so from his perspective, he like, I did the right thing. But not really, because we still needed you. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting um, take. I mean, first of all, folks, you guys need to share this if you haven't shared it already. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an interesting take because I, family is so nuanced. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had a discussion with my mother literally last week and she was explaining something about her childhood and i was like got it okay you know and put the pieces together you know yeah and it's funny because like you said you know your father in his mind thought he was doing the right thing but the question now becomes but at what cost right you wow. know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, in your mind, you feel like you're doing the right thing. And I'm sure a lot of parents, you know, not just your father, but I'm sure my parents could probably look back and go, I thought I was doing the right thing or I did the right thing as far as how I saw it. But, you know, we can say, ah, mm -hmm. I would have preferred you to do that if we can go back over, yeah. you know, um, but that's life. You know what I'm saying? Like, but you still love your dad. And oh, 100%. You, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like the humbling part about that is now you and I both are our fathers to our children. And we're still very much aware of some of the things that the generations before us did or didn't do, said mm -hmm. or didn't say. And it's like, OK, so let me be very um conscientious you know what i mean like let me be very intentional about what i do how i move what i say what i don't say because i know how what my parents did or didn't do impacted me for the good or for the not so good yeah and i will tell you um i don't think this is a popular take though um is that you know we don't i can speak for me we don't talk about our dead. We don't really know what really inflicts our family from the most part. Yeah. For the most part. So, like from, from a holistic view, there are certain things that has trouble. I'm sure you have cousins who are like, man, like where do they get that from? Mm -hmm. But somebody down our line that we're directly connected to suffered with some of these things. Yeah. And we have no idea. So there are what we would call generational curses that are running rampant in our families, certain types of witchcraft that are running rampant in our families, but we have no idea what the source was for us to properly deal with. 100%. And no. I think, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. no I was going to say, I, I totally agree with you. And I think the origin of that is couched in, um, I know this may be a stretch, but at least for African Americans, I think the origins of that is couched in our oppression 150, 200 years ago, up until now. Yeah. You know, it's like, don't talk back. Because if you talk back to the master, you know, you're going to get us all in trouble. Or, you know, just do what you're told. 
you know, and it's those generational things that we just pass down. I mean, the thing that my mother and I were talking about the other day was well, she was saying, well, my father, you know, said X, Y, and Z, and that's why I did X, you know, A, B, and C, you know, and it's like, you got to think, okay, so her father grew up in the ni early 1900s, <laughs> you know, raised by his parents who were maybe a generation or 30 years maybe removed from slavery. Yeah. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. technically speaking, slavery wasn't that long ago. It really wasn't. That's 18, so 1865. I mean, I know nobody alive today was ever a slave. I understand that. Yeah. But we're talking about 400 plus years of institutionalized slavery. Yeah. And then even after the abolishment of slavery, you go into reconstruction and then Jim Crow and then segregate. I mean, so it's not like, okay, slavery's over. Okay. It's all done. Everything just vanishes. No. You have people who suffered and lived through certain things and developed certain mentalities and mindsets and, you know, all of that stuff. And it gets passed down from generation to generation to generation. And sometimes we don't even know, like you said, to your point, you might be wrestling with witchcraft or wrestling with something that's like, why am I struggling with this? And you know, the crazy thing is, is that sometimes we have artifacts from our previous ancestors that is witchcraft. Yeah, 100%. We hold, we hold so near and dear to it because it was our ancestors. But it's like, but what is that is the scenario in your life? Mm. Which you don't, you don't really know. Right. Like, because let's be honest, a lot of people, and I'm not going to say I'm the best at it, but symbolism, we're not mm. that aware of stuff, you know? And that's, this is not even about symbolism, but that's, that's why we think the devil has all these horns. Right. Symbolism. That's, kind yeah. of, that's how we depict him. But yeah. with, in reality, with, a, with a red tail. <laughs> yeah. Like that's how we depict him. And that's why people have the wrong idea of who's talking to them. Because yeah. they're expecting a, a red horned guy with a tail, like you said. And it's like, no, he looks like you and me. He has a beautiful voice. <laughs> like, he's always beautiful. You know, you just made me think. Because, like you said, we what you didn't use this word, but the word that I want to use for what you're describing is, is is the word soul tie. Yeah, we get soul ties, like you said. Oh, well, Mama Pat gave this to me. You know, great grandma had always had this little statue, or you know, or, or whatever, and. We don't, oh, it's great great grandmas. And yeah, yeah, but do you know that great great grandma was a witch? <laughs> yeah. And that's hard to hear. Right. <laughs> that's hard to hear because, like, how dare you say that about my grandparent? Like, she loved me. Yeah. Just because she loved you doesn't mean she was tied up in the right stuff. And that's in every family. And that's tough to hear. Like, Real tough. Me, some people, like, I had to like I found out about certain struggles in my family, and I was low key offended that they were talking about my people like this. But it was true; they overcame it. But it was they still dealt with it, right? You know, so it's like you. It's just, it's so important to understand the truth about your line. And you know, it's interesting, you know, because like as you were talking about that, it made me think about the, um, Israel. Mm -hmm. They never lost sight of who their forefather was because the blessings came. The blessings mm. and the curses came by who their forefather was. Right. Even to this day, if you see people walk around, they say, oh, I'm from a tribe of Judah. I'm from a tribe of Reuben. I'm from this. They never lose sight of their like where they descend from. They always try to tap into that because they have to realize that the blessing of the curse comes from there. Right. So it's like it's interesting that we now, like you said, dealing with slavery and all these different things and all the different things we've picked up in those in those historical uh, experiences that we we don't want to talk about it because it's too scarring. It's, it's, it's too much. But when you think about it, the way we parent, you know, the way we deal with people around us, yeah. the trust issues that we have all really stem from those stories that we're not willing to tell. And we are so... And it hurts us so bad that we're willing to allow every generation to feel the wrath of it. What goes on in this house stays. 
stays. And um, me and my, I had a cousin that we talked about that one day. And um, and because I think in every family there are some dark, dark stuff that has happened that nobody wants to talk about. And yeah. I had a cousin who I feel like she understood some of the things that had happened in the past in our family and our line. But my issue was that it angered the person and it would be used as a weapon and not for healing. Mm. So I'm like, I got to the point where I stopped talking about it because I saw very quickly that you're using this and you're putting it in your back, like an ace in your back pocket. Like you playing spades, you got the big joker, you keep it in your back pocket. Like I dare you to step out of line and I'm gonna slap this bad boy on the table. And it's yeah. not going to heal anybody, but it's going to hurt everybody. Yeah, it's manipulation. We're talking about generations, right? Yeah. So you're about to punch a whole generation in, like at the core because you're about to try to expose something very, very dark about an individual that nobody ever seen this way. Wow. And once you expose it, you change their vision forever. And this is not the same, but it's no, in my mind, it's very similar to what God was trying to prevent Adam from and Eve from crossing over into. Mm. Don't eat of this truth of this tree because your eyes are going to be open. Yep. And their eyes were open, and now they knew the difference between good and evil. They had wisdom and they had knowledge of things they were never supposed to have knowledge about. Right. Now, I'm not saying that our family should never talk about these things, but we should talk about it in a way to bring healing and to understand, hey, this is what we've dealt with historically. Right. You know, like if I never knew my dad dealt with alcoholism and dealt with drug issues, I probably wouldn't have known to stay away. Because who knows? I tell people all the time, like in college, I never got drunk. I never smoked weed, none of that stuff. And people are hot, like, you didn't never try it? I'm like, look, I know my family line. But all I know is knocking on my door waiting for me to just be so curious and try it and actually know I'm hooked. Right. That's how I thought about it. So I'm like, I'm not going to give it a gamble because I got things I got to do and I'm not trying to go that way because even the one who suffered from this doesn't want me to be that way. So I got to try to go a different route. But it's, it's just, man, I just wish there were things that we would be – taught about our, our like generational our ancestors that will help us understand just more of what we what we're really dealing with but the fact I think, that either way we don't we don't really learn anymore. I, 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 I totally agree with you I, I just it, it's I'm sitting here thinking like what keeps us from having those conversations really is is pride. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Quite, quite frankly, you know what I mean. But it's it's like pride unto death. You know what I mean. Like to your point, how many things could be circumvented and prevented if if our grandparents, our parents would just talk? Yeah. Just just son, sit down. Let me tell you something. You know, come here, sweetheart. Let me let me let's go out to lunch. I got to get some things off my chest. I need to share with you. You yeah. know, just. And, and like you said, not in the spirit of uh, throwing somebody under the bus or, you know, not in the spirit of, of, of you know, condemnation and, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of a thing. But, you know, something like, you know, and, and hopefully you guys who are watching tonight, hopefully you're getting some something out of this to where you'll be empowered and encouraged to have conversations with your kids, you know, but. Uh, but just something along the lines of, hey, son, I, I noticed this about you, and I want you to know that that's something that I struggled with as well, mm-hmm. and I don't want you going down that path. Yep. You know, uh, something as simple as like yesterday, uh, the other day, I, w- I take my son to school, Christopher, to, uh, both of them to school, and pick him up and pick up Christopher every day, and um I'm thinking, okay, he's he's about to be 16 in December. He's about to go into another year of high school. You know, this going to go by so fast. I wish I would have had somebody to tell me about credit cards and interest rates. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So so I'm, I'm already beginning to have a conversation with him. I'm like, you know, Christopher, do you know what a credit card is? 
do you know what interest rate is? Let me tell you how they they get you. You know, you're 18 years old and they send you a, a credit card in the mail with a $3,000 limit and you're a college student. You don't have a really good job. So what are you thinking about? You're thinking about food and clothes, but you always got this card to swipe, to swipe, to swipe. I said, here's how they get you. They got these little, small, minimum payments that do nothing to your principal, and then you're just paying and paying and paying and paying, and then you max out a car, and then you will get another one. Mm -hmm. Like, I wish somebody would have told me that. Yeah. That's you know what I'm saying? And, and I mean, I know that's not necessarily spiritual, per se, but how many families are suffering financially because they consistently make bad, bad financial decisions? Well, you know, but what, what you said, I think it is spiritual because you talk about that. Yeah. So think about it. There are generations of people who who are still yet to see the first homeowner in their family. You're right. You're right. Everybody's confined to the apartment thinking. Because, oh, I'm so far in debt. I can't afford a house payment. Not realize that it's pretty much the exact same. Like you're paying $900, $1,000 for a two-bedroom apartment. Yeah. If you would just buckle down and get your credit in order, you could afford a house. Yep. And trust me, I've, I've had conversations with friends. Or recently, one of my friends... Um, saying that she's looking for an apartment. I'm like, have you considered a house? Oh, I don't think I'm ready for that. Why not? The same payment you're about to go give somebody at a rental place. You can literally go find a house. Already have equity in it. And you got kids. You change their future. Exactly. You change their baseline. And that's, and we, again, we'll talk about it. There are things like even with stocks and stuff like that. Like I dabber in it. I don't really understand it that well. But you best believe I'm going to educate myself to see how this really works and how I need to go about it so that when it comes time for my daughters and my future kids, however many else come at this point, they have a different baseline. You know, Man, I just bought this book about a month ago. Yeah. Listening to one of my elders. It says, Your Investments, 1990, a Guide to Your Investments, 1999, and by Dunn and Bradstreet. And it breaks down income plus appreciation, convertibles, junk bonds, mutual bonds, mm -hmm. you know, all this stuff. And the, the point I'm making is, to, to your point, it's like we've got to educate ourselves so that the, 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 those that are coming after us, like I believe, I believe that my sons, like I believe their basement should be right here. Yeah. Yep. You understand what I'm saying? Like their their lowest level should be my at my peak. Mm -hmm. Yep. I heard you preaching that. You, you always said that you, your ceiling should be their floor. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But I, and I'm not just saying like I really believe that. And so it's like at, at 40, I'll be 42 in November. I'm thinking, OK, what what am I going to be doing in the next 20 years? So that my sons can be like, man, my dad did this. He took care of that. Da, 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 da. And shucks, in 20 years, I'll be 60. That's not old. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I'll still be able to enjoy life, but I want to be able to enjoy it without the stresses mm -hmm. and set my sons up for success as well. Absolutely. And I think what people have to understand is that your generation can be blessed now. And you yeah. can take it, you can, you know, you can, you know, take it back a step. Like, just because you, you're here now, doesn't you're here now doesn't mean you stay here. Exactly. Your decisions impact the rest of the future. Your mm -hmm. the people who came before you who put you in a good position, did their job. Now, what are you going to do? And too often, Lord help me, because I'm seeing it so often in our community, is that you see grandparents, parents, work extremely hard to set their kids up and that third generation <laughs> wants to be in the struggle so bad that they lose everything. They lost all the momentum for the family. And I remember there was a video of uh, the video I watched a long time ago where this guy talked about his, his great grandfather walked to work 
his his father rode a bike he drove a car his son will um drive a car but his grandson will ride a bike and his great great grandchildren will be back walking pretty much talking about how you know when people inherit certain things it loses its value and people end up losing it because they don't understand the work that it took to get it see two things and particularly in our community um and this happens even in church circles we have this affinity towards um i i pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and and, and you gonna do the same thing mm -hmm. i hate that and, and i get that right I, I really i do i understand that because you want to you want to pass on work ethic you want to pass on a sense of um uh hard work and and value and you know those sorts of things i understand that but i also would rebut that and say well that's the benefit of having a father yeah or that's the benefit of having not necessarily a father but just someone to 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 who can even pass down a blessing yeah you understand what i'm saying like why does why does my children or grandchildren have to suffer the way that i did when I've suffered and can give them something that will put them five, 10, 20 years ahead. Absolutely. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to tell you why I hate it. And I know hate is a strong word, but I really do hate it. Yeah. Because every group around us, every other community around us don't do that. Exactly. On average. We yeah. have just some, some random stories here and there about, I think there was a guy who had a big fortune and he ended up giving all his fortune to um like some type of charity and telling his kids that they should work that's just <laughs> crazy like but i hate it because you can set christopher up really well but still make him work for the full access exactly like my daughter will have the basic things she needs but that does not mean she's not going to sit down and have to learn how to balance stuff and learn right. that you can't just go spending things just because you got it. It doesn't make sense. We all have done it. Like, I will be honest, like, I love shoes. I've got shoes in my closet I've never worn. And now that I got them, I'm like, man, that was pretty crazy of me. But I had it and I've never had a chance to experience it. Now I can sell them and still get my money back. But the reality is that typically when we, are, we come from quote unquote nothing, our eyes are always gonna be bigger than what we really need. And that was the other, and that was the other word. Great segue. Priorities. Yep. Priorities. When you talk about these other uh, ethnicities and other communities, a lot of them, not all, and like I said, I'm just speaking in a general term, in ge general senses, did not come to the United States under the same conditions that African Americans did. That's very true. And so. And so their priorities were completely different. Mm -hmm. For us, generally speaking, it was survival, um, <laughs> fighting for equality. You know, it was always struggle bus, you know, going up this rough side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. But for other communities, their, their country of origin, that's where they came from. Yep. They came from that. They're, all, they're in some cases, their entire country is is, is that way, right? Mm -hmm. We have people right now trying to get into America because a COVID statute is expired. The, I mean, there are people right now on the border trying to get into this country, not because they want a um, a mansion in a Benz. They just want to live and work. Yep. Like they don't need a fifty-five thousand square foot house and a hundred thousand dollar car. They just like I just need a house. I just yeah. need some place where I'm not worried about getting killed because these gangsters are after my daughter. That's real. But, I was literally just talking to someone about stuff like that. You know, it's like um, I was talking about like when you go vacation somewhere, and I was like, and you know, more places you go. You know they're not like 
like well, let's use Mexico for example. They have all these resorts, but everything is not peaches and cream over there. No. And actually, depending on where you go, it's really crazy to go off the, the resort. But we do it anyway, right? And I know years ago, maybe 2016, 2015, me and my brother, we went off the off the resort in Cancun. And nothing happened, but like when you looked around and had to see how people live, it wasn't the best idea. <laughs> you know, like you're talking about people having to pay to use the bathroom, people having to pay to, to wipe their behind with toilet paper, uh, a paper towel. Like people, it was rough. And like after we saw that, we were like, man, I want to go home, man. This just humbled me. Yeah. Because here I am in America, you know, just thinking life is so bad. But people really, like you, to your point, working like crazy. Like that's why you see a lot of, you know, people come from Mexico. These definitely the men. And they will work for minimum wage because, like, man, I need to send this money home and we ain't minimum wage at home. So, yeah, let me come take this job that you ain't willing to take. Because guess what? At home, if I keep doing this long enough, my family going to be somewhere rich. Priorities. Priorities. Yeah. yeah. Prior. I mean. Seriously. That's the word. And I, and I mean, and I, I, Lord Jesus, I'm about to get some hate mail on this. And, I, and this is not, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody because I'm including myself in this, what I'm about to say. In some degree, I've gotten, I've gotten better over the years. But it's like, we'll go out and spend $200, $300, $400 for an outfit. Yeah. A shirt. Some shoes. And I'm not knocking that. I, like, if you got it like that, okay, whatever. But you have a 500 credit score. You have $28.02 in your savings account. You don't own your home. Your car payment is almost $500 and your car is 10 years old. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. I'm really, really not. This is the stuff that I saw. I used to be a, a financial counselor to help people get into mortgages. So, I mean, I saw this stuff real life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, my people, my people, my people, my people, we got to get our priorities together. Yeah. Because just because you look good and you flossing and you, you know, bling blinging and all that other stuff, doesn't mean that your generations are set up for success. That's real. That's real. And the thing is, and I, I remember um, it was a while ago at this point, and it goes back to my point. Like, my mom, when she got married when I was nine, but my mom still had the mindset that we were her responsibility and not his. That's just how she operated. Um, now, he did things for us. Like, when it came to homecoming, he to go buy some clothes. He would take us to a place to show us what we needed to do, what we need to get. Like he would, he would take care of like the manly things, but like the providing part, my mom really took the, the bulk of that onto her own shoulders. Um, and we talk about priorities. My mom ain't rich. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she wasn't proud for her sons to see her struggle, but she allowed us to see the struggle. Mm. And what you're talking about is people who are trying to fake it. Yes. And not expose the people to what is really going on. You know, and I think a lot of times, and this is this is the reason why our credit score gets to 500 is because you're about to see your kids smile and tell them the truth. Oh my God. Please say that again. You would rather see your kids smile than you tell them the truth. Oh. Like, and my mom, I'm not gonna sit here and say that my mom wasn't a victim of that victim of that too, but they, it got to a point where it was like, oh man, we see where we are, we really are. Like she was never, she was never a, the mom to be like, oh, we got everything we need, we do it. Like, no, my mom will share stories of where we really didn't have it at all. And she told the story at church, <laughs> apostle, <laughs> and me and my brother was embarrassed. We were like, how dare you tell that story? 
But then there was a, a major a major blessing follow me. And so I'll tell it because I know she's not ashamed of it at all. So no lie, Apostle, we were kids. We were, we were old enough to know what was going on. And we walked in the Kroger with like $7. She was like, she had us by the hand. And she was like, we're about to go in here and get a protein, a starch, and a green vegetable. In my mind, I'm like, not with $7 we ain't. <laughs> There's no way. Like, it's just not possible. We got fish sticks, potatoes, and like broccoli. And no lie, possible. Because my mom, like, she she's going to make it happen. Like, this woman was in faith. <laughs> I mean, she was tapped in. <laughs> like, she was in it. And no lie, everything we rang up started to ring wrong. So in Kroger at that time, I don't know how it is now, but at that time, anything that rung up wrong, you got for free. Apostle, we walked out of there with a protein, starch, and the green vegetable, and me and my brother had lunch money for the rest of the week. Wow. She allowed us to walk with her in the struggle. Yes. But her faith never waned. But see, you, you, I think you or my mom were um, related because <laughs> <laughs> we wore hand-me-downs. Oh, yeah. We wore like, garage sale stuff. Um, my mom shopped at the cheapest uh, grocery store. And, you know, it was never, we never really had like snacks. It was always like the, the most necessary kind of stuff. You know, and like you said, she 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 did not allow us to. I mean, she allowed us rather to see, you know, the, the struggle. You know, she kept us in church, Bible class every Tuesday night, Sunday school, and you know, Sunday service. Like my mom was the goat as it relates to that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and so I think that's what where, where I get that. You know, we got to have priorities straight. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, I mean, there's a balance to that, obviously. I mean, you want to take your kids on a nice trip sometimes, too, and da, 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 da. But here's what happens a lot of times is to your point. We don't want to tell our kids the truth. Mm -hmm. And so we'll bend over backwards, destroy our credit, destroy our health destroy our mental health just because we are afraid of saying to our children we're not able to afford that yeah and we're not going to do that right now you're going to do this mm -hmm. and we're no less than the family across the street we're no less than the family down the street because what well, here's that word again priorities mm -hmm. so it's like I love you. You love me. We're a family. And I'm going to pass on the, the, the more important things. Right. And again, I'm not saying we should take a vow of poverty, you know, um, but but at the same time, so often those of us in our community just we, we become because there's residuals to that kind of thinking. Right. Yeah. Mentally, not just. So it's like entitlement. I used to be a mentor at an elementary or uh, middle school. And I'm like, I ain't got no hair up here, but if I did, I'd be pulling it out because some of these children do not have any sense of respect. They don't have any sense of priorities. And, and it's because their parents aren't parents. And I'll, and let me stop right there before I say something I shouldn't say. No, so it's funny that you say that because I, it made me think about the, the Bible days. Let's think about, you know, like the Abraham, the Isaacs, the Jacobs. Like when it comes to parenting, like what I'm I'm quickly what I've quickly understood is that you know kids are very curious. Like mm -hmm. Dari, she's three now. I asked her to do something. She like, why? <laughs> she, why? But she means it though. Like she mm -hmm. really wants to know why. And but we're so used to being like, because I said so. And I've said that so many times. She doesn't understand that as a three-year-old. 
like so what am i conditioning myself to be how to respond mm -hmm. you know and then when you think about like the, the bible days like they had relationships with their grandparents their parents but these were still the people they were looking to go to for a blessing yep the words that came out of their mouth you know when it was time um for jacob i think it was to pass on or was it no maybe it was one or two it was jacob because he said all of them down and he he blessed them according yeah. to what Israel. Was said. yeah right yeah. so it's like man what are we, like what are we doing like why, why are we wasting time like why are we withholding the blessings why are we why are we refusing to adjust to change the course of our family we may not yeah. see it but yep. they will so even consider the, the wilderness Moses was leading people knowing that none of the people who was in that generation could cross over. But there were some people who were still going to carry the name that had to cross over. Yeah. So it's like the truth, like we can't allow not telling these, our generation the truth, stop them from changing the trajectory of the family. Yes. That is what's happening. And it's easy at this point not to be a parent. Mm -hmm. We let everything around us govern the way we parent. Yep. Or we weigh the the we weigh the, we weigh, uh, we weigh the, the, the pros and cons of kicking the dad out the house. What's the government benefit? It's better, man, that you're not here to be a father than it is if you stay here financially. I, I'm gonna say this. I mean, I, I, I my my uh my stepmother was telling me about a situation. Last week, she was telling me about a situation where she knew of someone that was pretty much gaming the system, you know, um, have 11 kids. 11 kids. And she's not even 30. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because it's uncomfortable. It's like, yeah, just think about that. Yeah, that's, that's... And, and and it's stuff like that. Like you said, what am I teaching my kids? Mm -hmm. What message am I giving to those that I'm responsible for for raising up? What am I really saying to them when I continue to make decisions? that impact the quality of my life their life and like what what am i really saying as a parent what am i really doing and what you're really saying what what, what comes to mind when you're saying this what really grows without a seed mm, a weed you took the word right out of my mouth <laughs> let me tell you man because like our house is a new build so our grass is just not coming in so even with the hydro seed, the grass is grown, but the weeds are too. Mm. But the hydro seed wasn't for the weeds. But but now that things are germinating, it's kicked everything into gear. And it, I was laughing the other day to myself. I said, if only the grass grew as fast as the weeds, I would yes. have a problem. I would not have a problem whatsoever. So what? So what are we really saying with that? The worst things for us doesn't need the seed. It doesn't need a seed. It can grow wherever there's room for it to grow. Yep. That's why we say the mind can be the devil's playground. Because where, where, where there's no good seed planted, you leave room for whatever wants to manifest. And, and that's and that's the thing too. I, I, th there are th there are these things called un unintentional consequences or unintended consequences mm -hmm. and talking about generation talking about how things are perpetuated talking about the importance of parenting and in some cases not all but in some cases there have been things that have happened in our families and in our generations that were completely unintended but because nobody took the time to think about the possibilities of the consequences, things slip through the cracks. Yep. Things just, you know, I mean, and again, I'm, I'm really not trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be, you know, insensitive to anybody, but 
when you have 11 kids without a father and your uncle, how can you parent effectively each child? So I know for me as a child, there are things, and I've said this for years, you know, children are great observers, but poor interpreters. Oh, yeah. And so they'll observe and see and hear and, and watch and, and, and notice and, and all of that other stuff. But because their brains, you know, your brain is not fully developed till you're 25. Yeah. So there's things that they see and remember and observe and all this other stuff. But they don't always have the language or the ability to articulate what they're process, what they're seeing. So right. their immaturity processes that information and it becomes a staple in their thinking. Mm hmm. Their immaturity processes what they observed, what they saw, what they heard. And, well, this is what I saw growing up. Well, that's what that means. When I see a new man come in the house, then that means he's this or that. You know, or, I mean, and I'm not trying to be funny or, or whatever, but incest is real. It is. Like, all that stuff is is real. And, and like, you, to your point, we have to be able to have hard conversations in the spirit of honesty, in the spirit of preservation to for our generations. Mm -hmm. Not to not to condemn, not to cause further hurt or woundedness or damage, but we gotta get out of that that curse. What goes on in this house stays in this house. Man, there's so much crap that has happened in our houses that we're dealing with today that we bring to our jobs, that we bring to our marriages, that we bring to the church because nobody was able to talk about it. Yep. That's real. And it's just like for me, like just, just going back to men for a quick second, like and what you're talking about, like, if, like I, I don't know the situation, but 11 kids and no dad around. That's tough because I don't know how many boys is in this 11, but I'm sure there are some. The probability is that there are some boys in there. Yeah. So let's say it's just two, right? Now you now and the dad is not around. That's just just for example. I don't want to. I don't know, lady. More want to pick on. Me. But what I'm saying is, say there are two boys out of 11. Never seen a male. A male figure. You just talk to them boys that it's easier to not be a dad. Exactly. You know, like, I don't think people understand. I, like I said, my mom had three boys. Like, my oldest brother had one son. Devon has two girls. I have two girls. Like, I don't think people understand how hard it is to father daughters. Definitely when you grew up without female figures really being around mm -hmm. because though my mom was around and she's a female my mom had to be tough she was raising boys black boys at that you know so she was on edge a lot of the time because we were rough she didn't like us fighting each other like there were only two things that would get us whooping 100 percent of the time getting in trouble in school and fighting each other that was non-negotiable anything else you could probably work your way around. You probably get some you get this leather. <laughs> yeah, but those two things will get you were getting a whooping. And but it made so much sense later in life. When yep. you see a story, or you see people drop out of school, like people make it to the point where they don't feel like a degree is even important nowadays. When I'm gonna be completely honest, it's hard to get a job at McDonald's nowadays. So it's like, and then when you see a story, you know, I'm a teenager, I see a story, I hear a story about these brothers fighting and their brother killing his own brother. Yeah. So the stuff made sense, you know, that she was really hard on us about those type of things. But like trying to raise daughters and there was really no feminine figure around other than my mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother. I have aunts, but they tough too. So like trying to allow them to teach them to really express themselves, even my wife, understanding her in certain aspects. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up with women like that. Yep. So, like, you're sitting here making a big deal of this. I'm like, oh, this is a regular day <laughs> to me. But it's like, but you got to understand where she's coming from. Right. Yep. So, like, now God has made 
he blessed me with two beautiful little girls. I love them. They're so smart. But he's made me have to look at the life of a girl. Wow. Of a young woman and really understand their value, understand how they should be treated. Because as a young man, and you're not really seeing this respect given to women around you all the time. What do you do? Naturally, you go disrespect somebody else's daughter. Right. 100%. And he ain't going forward depending on who he is and how active he is. And depending on even the uh, the presence of the father, she ain't going for it. I was going to say this, too, because I was raised similarly to you, to you and, and just the sensitivities of even your wife. Yeah. Like, because your mother wasn't talking to you probably about women things you know what i'm saying no. she was you didn't have you know big sisters or you know or or little sisters to you know go through you know what you know girls go through and you know have to deal with and so then you get married and it's like what <laughs> mm-hmm. huh? <laughs> what are you talking like what is going you know what is that you know and 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 it's a learning curve it is you know, um, but at the same time, to your to your point, and, I, and I'm proud to hear you say this as we're kind of wrapping this up. It's like you've got to have the the nimbleness of mind, right? To be, and I think I said this probably 40 minutes ago. Got to be intentional. Mm-hmm. You got to be intentional. You got to okay. I can't do this. I can't do that. I got I got to make adjustments here, and I got to make adjustments there. Because I am keenly aware that I'm playing a part of adding to the generations in my family. Absolutely. Because I'm not going to be here forever. Yep. And I've got to make my contribution count. (laughs) And I will tell you, um, I've talked to my brother about this um, a few weeks ago. And like to, to not be here forever. You don't really think about it that much until you have kids. Yeah. Like life matters, but it's like, man, like now you leaving somebody. And it's like, and, and for anybody watching, like that's and you have kids, like that's the reality for all of us. The most righteous person is going to die. Yep. That's the 100 percent Where are we gonna I, leave? I uh I know it's gonna sound weird, but y'all can laugh at me if you want. I had my first surgery probably about three years ago. Um, I think it was mid, like late 2020, if I'm not mistaken. I had a, um, a biopsy in my, on my, in my mouth and they had to cut something out of my gums and stuff like that. And um, I was down for about a week. I was just eating like pudding and cottage cheese and stuff like that. And the thought came to me, I'm like, wow, I'm really not, uh, a robot, like I'm really in flesh and blood. You, you understand? Like I know that sounds crazy, but it's like you never think of your mortality or the fact that you can, you know, have high blood pressure or you know something can go wrong with you physically uh, until you get older and have some experiences, and then you think about just the importance of taking care of yourself. For your daughters, for my sons, for you know my grandkids that aren't even here, you know all of that stuff, you know. So, yeah. So I know we got to go, but I got to, to your point. I got to tell you this. So uh, when I first got up here, I told you I got a primary care physician, and um, there was just like you know you randomly you know you, you're a dude, so you talk to just randomly check yourself up and make sure ain't no lumps nowhere. I'm just doing it, and like in my neck, like right here, I felt a small lump movable but i'm like okay never really felt that before so now i'm like i don't even want to remember it i don't want to deal with it but i don't even want to remember it so i remember being at the doctor one day just randomly bringing it up and he was like he felt it and he was like i'm like is a lymph no he was like i don't know if it's a lymph no he said but let's go get a uh let's go get an ultrasound on so i'm like shoot <laughs> this is about to go left so, and you know, they send you over to schedule it. In my mind, I'm like, this needs to happen today. Right. They're yeah. Like, no, this is like a Tuesday, they're like, nowhere to see you Friday. That ain't good enough for me. <laughs> like you sent me home with all these thoughts in my mind. And there was one moment I had on the couch where I'm like, man, like, I don't know what this is. I don't think it's nothing but what if. 
I'm like, man, I don't want to leave y'all. And I told my wife, I said, man, I know you can do well by yourself. I said, these girls need me. And I was emotional about that. I'm like, man, these little girls don't understand. Like, they need me here. And I thank God everything turned out great. But the thought came to mind, like, man, one day I really have to leave. Yep. I really have to leave them. And as much as I love the Lord, we don't know what that preparation looks like. Mm. But we have no idea. Yep. And, you know, people, are, I can't wait to see him, but you, that's easy to say in theory when you're healthy. Exactly. But it's exactly. another thing when you're three days away. Real talk. Real talk. We're going to talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. What a, what a note to end on. What a note to end on as we're talking about generations. So, folks, listen, I pray, we pray that you were blessed by this conversation. We pray that we spoke to some things about where you are um, as a father, as a mother, as a grandparent, uh, an uncle, a niece, wherever you are, whatever part you play um, in your generations. We, we really hope that you got something uh, out of tonight's discussion. Listen. Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to be a blessing uh, to the Empowered Life Network. Um, as you can see on the screen there, um, those are our methods in giving. Um, you can give via Givelify. Um, you can give via PayPal. You can give also via Cash App. Uh, the handle is dollar sign EL Network, dollar sign EL Network for Cash App. Um, we want, but we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to sow into good ground, as we've been talking about seed, as we've been talking about generations, um, as we've been talking about those things. Uh, we pray that you were blessed tonight. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we pray that uh, you will share this with someone, share it with your, your wife, your husband, just share it, share it on your timeline. Let somebody know, like maybe we said something that you've been feeling, or maybe you uh, have been wanting to say to somebody and just didn't know how to say it, maybe just share this, you know, maybe let this be a conversation starter. So uh, again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Be a blessing to the ministry. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye now.